Good afternoon. I'm delighted to send this submission today and I am sorry that I'm not able to join you. I was very happy to be invited to this event because although I view the UPR system as a useful tool to highlight the experience of human rights defenders in the states under review, all too often commitments states make when they are under the microscope are quickly forgotten about when the focus moves elsewhere. I'm glad to see this effort at accountability and I reiterate that OHCHR and my mandate are ready and willing to assist where we can with the implementation of supported recommendations. When I looked at the series of recommendations relating to human rights defenders that Brazil supported in 2017, my first thought was that if these recommendations had been implemented fully, perhaps we would have seen fewer killings and attacks on human rights defenders over the past four years. Sadly, this is not the case. In my report to the Human Rights Council earlier this year, I highlighted that OHCHR documented the murder of 174 human rights defenders between 2015 and 2019 in Brazil, representing 13% of the global total recorded killed during that period. Just this past Monday, I spoke at the launch of the 2020 Global Witness Annual Report in which the killing of a further 20 land and environmental defenders in Brazil was recorded. A third of the communications the Human Rights Defender Mandate has issued on Brazil since the last UPR relate to killings or death threats. It is very clear to me that the situation for defenders in the country remains critical. One of the cases that has stayed with me is the shocking murder in January this year of Fernando dos Santos Arruja, a key witness and a survivor of the 2017 Pau Darco massacre and the ongoing judicial harassment of his lawyer, Jose Vargas Sabrino Jr. This case captures a number of the intersecting challenges facing defenders, which the 2017 recommendations addressed, namely to guarantee the physical integrity of human rights defenders and ensure that thorough and effective investigations are carried out in the case of the attacks. Here we had an attack on defenders demanding the right of communities to access land and land tenure, tenure, extrajudicial killings by state forces, a deeply flawed investigation of the perpetrators and the targeting of a human rights lawyer and witness for demanding justice and accountability. What I find most disturbing about this case is the lack of protection afforded to Fernando and Jose Vargas, despite the obvious danger that existed and continues to exist for Jose Vargas. It suggests a lack of political at will and at best a cavalier attitude of the authorities in taking their responsibilities to protect human rights defenders seriously. I spoke with Jose Vargas in July and he informed me of obstacles his own lawyer was now facing in accessing the criminal process against him. A number of the 2017 UPR recommendations also called for the strengthening of the national policy for the protection of human rights defenders. While it is commendable that such a policy exists, and I regularly encourage other states to adopt such policies, human rights defenders I have spoken to since I took on this role, have told me they do not have full confidence in the mechanism. They have highlighted that it exists only still as a presidential decree rather than a law, and that measures provided are not adequately adapted to the nature of the risks faced, and that there remains a lack of investigation into attacks when they do take place. In my report to the Council earlier this year, 
I heard highlights of the case of Kakik Babal, an indigenous leader and human rights defender who had received information from a confidential source about a plan to assassinate him and four of his relatives. Reportedly, the plan was developed in a meeting with local farmers and the representatives of civil and military police. Although Mr. Babao has been formally included in the protection programme at the time of writing the report, he still faced severe threats in his community and no investigation has been opened into the alleged assassination attempts. Much of the information I receive about violations against defenders in Brazil relates to indigenous peoples protecting their territories against land grabbing from loggers, cattle ranchers and miners. Rather than working to protect human rights defenders as recommended by numerous states and supported by Brazil in 2017, the lifting of environmental safeguards as happened last year results in the opposite of this. It places defenders, particularly indigenous defenders, at increased risk as the enabling environment is created for miners, loggers and cattle ranchers as opposed to for defenders. In March this year, I joined a communication highlighting escalating violence against Munduruki and Yanomani indigenous peoples as a result of illegal gold mining taking place in illegal in indigenous territory. Death threats were issued against members of the Munduruka Women's Association and other indigenous women opposed to the illegal mining. The association's premises were broken into and ransacked while defenders spoke of having to organize their own protection because authorities had not responded to the risks adequately. Mercury pollution and deforestation have also threatened their health and food security. This is typical of the type of cases my mandate receives information about. Yet sadly, the situation shows no sign of improving. I want to finish by again applauding this initiative. I believe increased accountability around supported UPR recommendations does provide a pathway in approving the ability of human rights defenders to carry out their work safely in Brazil. If there are particular areas where my mandate or the OHCHR office may be in a position to provide technical assistance on, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us and I really wish you well with this work. Thank you very much.